Um, welcome, Laura Vanderkam. It's great to have you here. I'm Dan Gretsch from BizHack, and uh, this is a really special treat. Uh, I'm used to doing kind of webinars for uh, many folks. Uh, this is a much more intimate conversation we're going to have today uh, with uh, someone whom I've known for almost 30 years. Uh, Laura and I were classmates at Princeton. I think you were one year after me in the press club where we together kind of cut our teeth as budding journalists. Uh, and um, you've taken it, it, it just so far and I congratulate you. How many total books have you published, novels and nonfiction total? <laughs> A lot. I know there's six books on time management. Um, there's, oh, let's see eight conventionally published nonfiction books on various topics um and then you could throw another novel in there too yeah there's there's a lot of books yeah um that's uh eight more than me <laughs> <laughs> but i am working on a book that i hope to Excellent. publish next year um i wanted to talk to you about a book that you i think this actually was the first book on your time management odyssey right 168 hours correct and um, you talk about kind of a phenomenon that's, I think, only gotten worse in the 12 years since you wrote it, which is time poverty. Um, and, and more than anything, a perception of time poverty. Um, and I wanted to ask you, you, you I, I thought you did a beautiful job um, in the preface of, of being humble and saying, look, I'm, I'm 30 years old when I write this, my life is a work in progress. Um, and I'm just super curious, you know, fast forward 12 years, um, you've written five other books on the topic. Um, when you think back to 168 hours, what what did you get right? And what might you uh, have done differently in terms of your advice? Yeah, well, it turns out that we still all have 168 hours in a week. That has not changed in the intervening 12 years. We still have the 24 hours in a day. 168 hours in a week. And so, I mean, the fundamental problem of time management is always the same, namely that we have this limited number of hours to work with and we wish to construct our big, beautiful lives within those 168 hours. And so in that sense, I mean, you know, that that problem won't change. Like we're all still dealing with that. There are certain, um, aspects of life that have have changed some in those intervening 12 years. I mean, certainly, I think the digital distractions have have gotten even more profound. Um, when I wrote 168 hours, smartphones were quite new. Um, you know, when I was writing it in 2008, 2009, that's when I first got a, a smartphone. Um, you know, so it was a little bit figuring out what would come out of out of this. And it turns out there's a great many distracting things that that have come out of it. Um, some good stuff too, of course. And so I think, you know, some of the things that people are dealing with in terms of distractions have been different in that amount of time. But I think back to something like The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey's book that came out in 1990. And he writes about people spending a lot of time on things that are urgent but not important. And we didn't even have email, most people back then. I, you know, so people have always managed to waste time. Um, so, so I think the fundamental aspects aren't aren't that different. I think some of the details may be, um, but we're we're always still wrestling with the same issues. Yeah, I can imagine uh, the 2022 time log has a lot of TikTok scrolling on it, uh, which obviously wasn't a thing back when you wrote it. The core tool that you use is the time log. And it's it's a kind of deceptively simple tool, but I've read a lot, not only about, I've read your book, but I've also read a lot about of the comments and commentary about your book. And it's kind of extraordinary how many people reference the time log as a, as a life transformational experience, that this simple, simple sort of obvious tool is actually uh, can lead to just profound realizations. And I was curious, how did you discover the time log tool? Um, and 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 what reflections do you have on its effectiveness and power to change lives? So as I was writing 168 hours, I realized that it might be interesting to know where those 168 hours might go. I mean, for myself and for other people too. And, and so as part of writing the, the book, I definitely kept track of it, had other people keep track of their time, um, share their time logs with me, just be, for the obvious reason. I mean, any any 
resource that you're looking at allocating, you want to know where it is currently going. And people who want to spend their money better, they need to figure out where their money is going currently and where they would like it to go. People who would like to eat more healthfully need to figure out how they're eating now and, you know, see what what plans they would like to, to make with that. Um, people track workouts, people track all these things. So it's it's the exact same thing with time, with the added dimension that time keeps passing no matter what you do. Um, you know, if you think about the next week, it is blank, like it hasn't happened yet. But eventually we will be on the other side of those next 168 hours and they will have been filled with something, no matter what you do. I mean, you lock yourself in a closet, it's still eventually gonna be the other side of the next 168 hours. And so because it keeps passing and time keeps passing no matter what you do, it is very challenging to spend time mindfully. Uh, and the only way to sort of get a grasp on this um, and, and to figure out what you would like to change or what you'd like to keep, what you like, what's working, what isn't, is to collect the data on where the time goes. Because uh, if you don't know where the time goes now, how would you even know if you're changing the right thing? Something maybe you thought was a problem isn't, or maybe something you haven't even considered is taking more time than you might have imagined. And because most of us don't know we have 168 hours in a week, I mean, we say 24 seven, people don't multiply it through. Um, it, we just don't even know what proportion goes to different things. It's all based on perception, how we feel. There's very little accountability for it. So, so the time log was just all about creating that accountability. And, and not accountability in the sense of like, gotcha, like you, you thought you were so busy and I see you've got three hours of TikTok scrolling or whatever it is that, that people are doing. And I, I do plenty of, of time wasting stuff as well. It's, it's that we can see that there might be time available that is spent on things we don't necessarily care about that we can then redeploy to things that might matter more. I know you're a journalist and I, you did a lot of research when you were building 168 hours. Did the time log tool come to you uh, through a source or was it something you developed on your own? No, I mean, I started, um, I, I think a reader had, I, you know, I had mentioned doing something like this and she's like, hey, you know, why don't you use this spreadsheet like this? And she sent me one. And it was like similar to what I was doing. I was like, okay, yeah, then maybe I'll you know, tweak it that way. So it had sort of developed in the course of, of writing the, the book. And but but the truth is, it's not, you know, fancy. People are sometimes like, can I get a copy of your time log? I'm like, well, you could just open Excel and then, you know, write the days of the week across the top, Monday to Sunday and half hour blocks down the left hand side, starting whenever you think is useful. For me, I started at 5 a.m. because I'm almost never up at 5 a.m. So that's like the start. And so everything happens within the day coming after that. But um yeah, you know, I've I've certainly looked at thousands of time logs over the years. I do an annual time tracking challenge in January. If anyone wants to join me, January 9 through 15, I'll be posting my time on my blog, lauravandercam.com. Um, I have a you you can I'll have the sign up soon on my website. You can sign up and you get like motivational emails every day if you want to track along. But sometimes it's just helpful to know that other people are doing it too. But I love, I find it fascinating. You know, all my books I've, I've collected some sort of, you know, stuff for, I mean, a hundred, I know, I know how she does it. I had tons of time logs from women in professional careers who are also raising families. Yes, that one, uh, just to, you know, see where does the time truly go and how do people make time choices? You can learn a lot from time logs that you can't learn from just asking people. One of our classmates was Tim Ferriss. Did you know Tim, undergraduate? I didn't know him at school, no. So part of what I think is really interesting about you versus Tim Ferriss is Tim looks at elite performers and tries to extract best in class habits from them. What, what I love about you is you're much more, you, you kind of look at everyday folks um, and try to extract their wisdom. And I, I find honestly your approach far more aligned with my mentality. I, I, elite, elite athletes, uh, elite performers intimidate me, but the folks in your book don't. Uh, and I find therefore your books far more approachable and accessible. Even the, the time log as a tool is deceptively simple. And, and yet that's why I find how profound people find it so interesting. So how did you come to settle on the average Joe and Jane as your inspiration and your teacher for your books? 
Well, I mean, it's partly who's who am I going to talk to? I don't know. I mean, I don't have Beyonce on speed dial or anything like that, um, which I guess maybe Tim Ferriss does. Uh, but I, I think it's more that there are more practical realities that most of us can learn from people who are doing a lot of really cool stuff, but it's cool stuff that we could imagine ourselves doing. Um, so most of us are, are not going to play in the NBA, but it would be cool to see how somebody who, you know, is, is managing a team of, of 15 people and has three kids also manages to play in the local basketball rec league. Like, I find that interesting. Like, how does that person make that happen? Uh, and, you know, let's, let's study that person's schedule and figure it out and see what we can take away from that, that the rest of us can perhaps learn from. Um, because, you know, yeah, we do all have the same amount of time. The Beyonce's of the world have the same amount of time as the rest of us. And, and they do, in fact, have to sleep and eat and, you know, interact with the people in their immediate circle as well. But um, apart from that, sometimes the, you know, the, the ways we spend our time might be at least a little bit different. And so I'm, I'm generally trying to aim for people that I think we can learn a lot from. Yeah, time's kind of a great equalizer. Well, I... Uh, I'm actually sitting in a room with my fellow, uh, several fellow entrepreneurs. I'm part of Entrepreneurs Organization in South Florida, and we have a group of uh, seven of us who read the book together. And so I'm going to pass it along now to my colleagues, uh, fellow business owners who will introduce themselves in the name of their business and then ask you a question. So here we go. First, uh, another Daniel. Hi, Laura. Nice to meet you. This is uh, Daniel Fernandez. My business is called AMZ Clever. It's an a uh, agency, digital marketing agency. And I'm new to your to your content, but it's very interesting. I wanted to ask you two two questions. One is, uh, you know, with all the technology, right? That we just uh, just trash talk a little bit in, um, a few minutes ago. Wanted to to ask you if there is uh, like apps or software that you actually see helpful. Uh, to apply, implement into your methodology. Um, I personally use one called Rescue Time that tracks, um, you know, which websites you're on, and then it gives you a score at the end of the day. Uh, just curious if you, you if you have used that or if you have any other uh, tools out there. Second thing is, this is a question actually more for for my wife. She's also a VC executive, and uh, we're expecting our first baby in March. And I wanted to ask you if you have or which of your books you would recommend for her to uh, read first. She wants to, uh, you know, remain, you know, productive while also, uh, you know, having a newborn. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, the the newborn phase you may not be incredibly productive, but eventually you sort of get back into the swing of things um, within a few months. I think um, you can definitely start to to get back into things. I, I'll answer the second question first. I think she would enjoy. I know how she does it um, because I studied lots of high performing women who did have families and looked at their time and saw where the time was going. And I think there's a lot of helpful strategies in there. Um, as for tools, I mean, yeah, rescue time could be great. I mean, even just this screen time app on your phone, right, can can show you how much time you're spending on various things, which can be helpful um, for a little bit of accountability if that's a number you're trying to change. Uh, there are many time tracking apps on the market. So if people are looking to track time digitally, um, that could be an option. Ones like Toggle. There's, I mean, there's a lot of them. A lot of them are sort of billing software that get repurposed for the, you know, idea of time tracking. Um, but that said, I'm, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of productivity apps overall. I mean, I know there are a lot of good products on the market. The problem is that apps tend to make our phones more interesting. And the cause of productivity is usually not served by being on our phones more, you know? And, and so whatever productivity was gained by using that app might be swallowed up by checking your phone four or five more times in the day. And then you don't stay at the productivity app, you go and do other things. And that's where, you know, all the digital distractions come in. So I think if you are gonna use any sort of app, you need to just be very careful of how you are using it and when you are using it and that you use it intentionally to only do what you're going to do and then put the phone away and get back to whatever it was that you you intended to do got it thank you and the first book for your wife um i know how she does it perfect yes yeah i don't know. 
This is uh, Verda. It's a very uh, sophisticated system we're using here, Laura. <laughs> Hi, Laura. This is Verda. I have a home textile business. It's called Mold Living. Um, so my question for you is, as you were writing this book and discovered your own 168 hours, what was the biggest aha moment for you personally? And what changes, if anything, did you make in your life based on your own discovery? So I think one of the biggest things I realized is how much time is just hard to even describe. Um, it's just you're kind of completely ambiguous, uh, unaccountable, like you're not doing anything in particular, but it's not quality downtime either. It's just like flitting from one thing to the other, you know, not really. And, and I've had people afterwards, they're trying to reconstruct their time logs and you know, people actually say things to me like, you know, whole hours disappeared, like without my notice, like what happened? Was I abducted? I, I don't even know, right? Um, and you can see how this would happen. I mean, during the workday, not so much. I mean, many people have, you know, lots of meetings or calls or whatever that kind of sort of set the tone of the day. But if you consider like a Saturday and maybe your family is doing something at one o'clock, but up until that time, it's kind of well, whatever else is going on. And you, it would be really hard to say what that was. And that's great if it's something that you are really enjoying, but many people it's, you know, you're half on screens, half like putting around the house, random housework that may or may not need to be done. You know, whatever, it's that sort of thing. Um, so I think that was the biggest discovery is how much of this amorphous time there is. And one of the things that I have taken from that is that I'm I'm not as kind of wary of having stuff put into that time. Like I'm okay with saying, oh, we wanna do this thing on the weekend. Like, let me plan ahead so we can have this adventure. Um, we're gonna spend Saturday morning, I don't know, going ice skating or something um, because it's like, I know the time is going to be more memorable and better spent doing something like that than this amorphous time that isn't really rejuvenating. It's just there. Um, I also, you know, I saw that I had time for things like singing a choir that, you know, this evening time was. What's the sound? That's the last day of calling. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah okay. it's okay. All right. Um, and, and so, you you know, all this evening time is sort of whatever. And so I was like, well, could I take one evening a week and go do something? Uh, yeah, sure. And and so, you know, make space for singing in a choir or something like that. So I think seeing that quantity of amorphous time um, helped me figure out that it was okay to put more sort of leisure time commitments into life because the space was probably there. Thank you. Good stuff. Hold on, it's not gonna. Oh, it's not gonna. Well, actually, yes. yeah. Okay. Hey, Laura, Stephen Sheck. Um, so you know, I'd always, uh, I always like to name drop. So like, whenever we're talking about, it, like, yeah, you know, Laura Vanny, she writes these great books, and I didn't realize that Dan would one up me going, I know Laura, and next thing you know, you're here. So um, I'm gonna try to name drop like you know Bill Clinton and see yeah. if we can get him on the next <laughs> meeting him, yeah. or Beyonce. I'm just gonna Beyonce. throw Beyonce and hopefully someone knows her. Next meeting. Next meeting. Um, so uh, back when I read the, I think it came out what, in 2010, the book and and back then, and I, I read it pretty. I don't even know what the the impetus was for me reading it. Um, I have four kids, and the oldest um, back then was. Uh, uh, 11, uh, 10. So she was 10 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, and my baby was five. Now my baby is 16 and my oldest is 22. So, um, and I remember going through your books and then reading uh, the next one, which my wife still doesn't forgive me for, for reading what successful people do before breakfast. Um, so there's a good two or three years where I was waking up at 5 a.m. every morning and I was at work, sitting at my desk in 20 minutes later. And then I would exercise like all before 7 a.m. Um, and thankfully that, that that those days ended. Um, and so, uh, which leads to my question of how often, um, obviously life changes, right? Like my life when my baby was five and now he's 16 and driving changes. How often do, do you find that people need to reset, right? Like reset, like this is, uh, and, and 
you know, kind of what my to-do is. I'm also a big fan of uh, David Allen's book um, of getting things done, which is, he was kind of like the first one. So all to-do apps, just, you know, all, like if you ever find like a to-do app um, that, that keeps your, like I use Todoist, it's all based on getting things done. Like this guy who originally wrote this book, they're all based so that you can use it for him. So how often do people need to reset and rethink their lives? It can't be all the time, but it, you know, and it should be somewhat regularly. Uh, what do you recommend on that? Well, I think life can kind of nudge this on you anytime something big changes. So, you know, a lot of people look at their routines differently when the school year starts, or maybe a kid starts a different school, for instance, right? And the time that high school starts might be different mm -hmm. than the time the middle school starts or the elementary school starts. And so that will wind up changing things or people get a new job or they have, you know, a very different client mix. And so the, their schedule's entirely different or you move a house, move houses or, so, you know, any of these major changes should probably trigger a look at your time, your schedule, what's working, what isn't. Um, I recommend people track time, you know, at least twice a year. Um, if you're, if you do it annually, that's great. I mean, twice a year would be better. Probably quarterly is, is a good thing to aim for, for most people, because it's just enough to kind of tune things up. Um, but it, you know, you mentioned the morning routine thing. I, this is particularly one that I, I, every time I read somebody's morning routine, I'm like, that is a snapshot in time, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it, it is, there's very few people who do the exact same thing every single morning for like the entirety of their lives it, because life ch does change. And, you know, the time your kids are waking up when they're little versus when they're older or when they're out of the house or when you have a different job, it's all going to be very, very different. And so it's important to recognize that any given setup we have is a snapshot in time. It's probably not an immutable reality. Um, but because of that, that you know, allows us to introduce these fresh starts at other points that you know, we see what we do like to do. Um, maybe you don't have to get up at 5 a.m. to exercise and start working, but you do like the idea of working a little bit first thing in the morning and then maybe taking a break and doing some other things and coming back to work. And, and you know, that could happen at any stage of life. Mm -hmm. um, so so it's, I think it's, it's frequent. Um, usually there are some life changes that will nudge it, but if you aren't getting any major life changes, uh, everything's kind of the same as it was, then, then maybe once a year or so um, analyzing everything mm -hmm. that's going on and seeing what's working and what's not. Awesome. Cool. All right. Moving right along. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm dark, but it's all right. Hi, Laura. I'm Catherine Dobo. So I own a, a digital, well, a legal marketing firm. A lot of what we do is digital. Um, so I do spend a lot of time on my phone just because that is a output of what we do. But that's not my question. So when my husband heard that I was reading this book, he was very concerned because he says that I'm obsessed with productivity and time management. And he was very worried that it was just going to get worse. Um, <laughs> Uh, so my question is, for those of us that are time hackaholics and are constantly looking at our time, um, is there an answer to building in that me quiet downtime that you have found? And what does that optimal amount look like? Well, I think it differs for everybody, but I don't think there's a problem with, I mean, people are like, well, you plan every minute, like, whoa, whoa, you should, you shouldn't plan it. But you know, if you're going to build in downtime into a life where there are digital distractions all the time, you do have to actively do it because if you don't like, it won't be downtime, it'll be TikTok time. I mean, it'll be something else. You have to actually think about your time in order to build in white space. And and I, I know a lot of people are like, what? That sounds crazy, but you do. And and I'm sure you understand that. Uh, and and so I think that's how you can approach it. Like as you're building your schedule saying, where can I leave more open time? And, and sort of even since you're into productivity, make it a challenge for yourself. Like, could I build in an extra hour of white space into this week? You know, could I build in another hour this week? And that's there for many reasons. I mean, one is it's just for contemplative time um, or for whatever you know chosen rejuvenation you need in the moment it can also be there to absorb emergencies i mean life happens stuff comes up and the more white space we have the more we are able to absorb that um when it does happen as opposed to i mean the problem when people do have stuff put in every minute is when stuff comes up either good or bad it has to displace something and you know the whole schedule can kind of fall over like dominoes um whereas if you have open space then you either put the stuff that came up there or you have a spot to put 
whatever it displaces. Um, so, so that's how I kind of like to, to think about that. Um, you know, I, I also think that we, with anything, you know, we can go overboard on, on metrics that don't matter. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be clear with, productivity that we're getting what matters done like crossing stuff off a list is not exciting in and of itself i mean it feels good but we could put a hundred things on a list that didn't have to be done and then feel great about crossing them off in the most efficient manner but that didn't really get anything to happen um so i think constantly being aware of limiting to-do lists um pushing all the little stuff that's fun to cross off but but isn't all that important to specific blocks of time um so we can batch those little things and then keep them from being something we do do the rest of our time um and since this is also your husband who was mentioning this that it was a, a an, an issue um i would also put in that one of my cord cardinal productivity rules is that people are a good use of time and so whatever you can do to invest in that relationship is probably wise because you know when people complain about stuff it's it, it like they don't complain about things that don't matter to them personally it'd be like you say you love blueberry pie i'm like great i'm not gonna <laughs> complain about that <laughs> that's even if i like a different kind of pie not 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 really my business but when people are complaining that your way you're too into productivity maybe it's he's feeling that it's you know at his expense that you're not spending time to gather because you're more interested in getting other things done. And so if that's the case, then that that's probably the underlying thing. And so investing more time in that relationship, you know, even challenging yourself to do more of that, like, could I increase that by an hour, you know, in the, in the course of a week might, might be helpful. Awesome. Thank you. So, oh, moving, moving down. Hi, Laura. Hi. You're going to people, Laura. You're, it'll fly by, I promise. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shannon Lewis. Um, you know, for e, I have a couple of businesses. For EO, I have a asset allocation a wealth tech business. But I was, you know, I was listening to your book and I was reading your book and something struck me about it. Let me circle back. I just tried time blocking, by the way. My anxiety level went down like 50%. Great. It really kind of helped me out. But you said you mentioned something about self worth and tying that being tied to like saying how busy you are all the time, you know, and that makes people feel like they're more important, powerful. It's just wondering if you could expand on that and have your readers and audience come back to you and said like, "Hey, that I really, you know, just an observation. Did I, I saw that within myself." I think a lot of people um, do get excited about talking about how busy we are. I mean, I mean it's a way you can relate to other people like oh you know we all have these busy schedules we're all doing so much but fundamentally i mean busy is a way of showing that there is a high demand for your time which mm -hmm. is a nice way of saying like how important you are right like i'm not going to sit there and be like woohoo look how important i am but i'd be like oh i'm so busy <laughs> every minute booked up at work oh you know i'm so busy at home all these people need me that must be how important i am and you know, it, it, there are certain phrases of life where you are more in demand than than others, and and that's you know those years might be more full than than others, um, and certainly more hours might be spoken for in certain times of our lives than others. But I think for many of us, it helps to focus on putting things into our lives that are chosen and that we are actively choosing them. And if we're not in a situation where it feels like more of our time is actively chosen then we're going to feel busier because it feels like there's more things kind of put on us as opposed to things that we are truly choosing to do. Um, and I think, you know, the, one of the phrases from 168 hours that has, you know, stayed around that people quote back to me and I, I still find people um, that resonates with people is just that I don't have time really means it's not a priority that there's almost anything like you claim you don't have time to do you don't have time to iron your sheets or you know dust your blinds or whatever it is um like if somebody offered to pay you a hundred thousand dollars to do it like yeah i'd go iron my sheets right like it, it's not um it's not that i don't have time it's that it's not a priority like there's other things i would prefer to do with my time and, and that is true for a lot of stuff and, and there may be consequences for saying you know that 
what's a priority and what, what isn't. But um, as much as we can keep that mindset and, and recognize that if we truly do want to do something, it's, it's the equivalent of like saying, I'm, I would pay myself a lot of money to do that. Like, can you get that sense of urgency to it? Um, right. Because ultimately, you know, it's our lives. Like there's no prize for not enjoying life, like for being the busiest right. person. Yeah. <laughs> you you want to no make sure are. that you're filling it with what you want there. Right. Well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Hey. I'm Keish Basnani and uh, my company is called Nomad Lane. We design travel bags and accessories and I work with my wife. And we also have a young uh, 21 month old as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, we both work together from home and uh, we're like quite literally on top of each other all day long. <laughs> and some days we, you know, like after he goes to bed, after we put him down around 7, 7.30, we just sit there and wonder where our whole day went. Um, it's quite common. So like, you know, I think uh, reading your book, I really appreciated uh, seeing the time blocking part. That was cool. Even I put into practice today is I had this meeting on my calendar, but I did block out the 45 minutes it takes me to come here as well. So I'm like starting to do those types of things that works. Um, my thing is, is that, <clears throat> especially in reading the book, it's like, I know that, okay, we need to outsource these like menial tasks and things like that. But my wife and I, you know, we run a business and cash flow is important. So I think my issue sometimes can be like, oh man, how much is it going to cost? Oh no, it costs this much. And like, it's just kind of like normalizing, okay, well, if it costs this much, think about how much more we could earn if we, you know, can actually have time on the business instead of cleaning up the dishes every 10 minutes. That's like where I am at, like mentally. Um, didn't know if you've ever, like, if you've kind of gone through anything similar, because like, obviously when you bring in people to help you out, there's a cost and time associated with that. And I know, obviously, if I was paying myself to do what I do, I'd be paying myself 10 times more, right? <laughs> um, but it's like, that's kind of like where I am right now. And uh, going into next year, like, I'm telling myself to do better by that um, yeah i mean it's it's hard and and i totally get that because we see money <coughs> more specifically than we tend to see the cost of time yeah. and yet time is more absolutely limited than money you you could make more money but you will never get an hour back once mm. it is gone and there are many things that we still choose to do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're choosing to spend lots of time with your toddler, for instance, um, mm -hmm. you know, even time that obviously you could earn more for, for all those hours that you are spending with your toddler, but you want to spend the time with your toddler. And, and so that's, right. um, that's a choice there. But to recognize that some other things may not be worth that. Um, there was a very, very small survey of uh, I found once, I think I wrote about it in USA Today, of um, some women business owners whose, whose businesses had first crossed the seven figure mark. And, and they, you know, they were part of this program. And so people looked at all the things they were doing. And one of the commonalities is that they were all getting their groceries delivered. And this was years ago. This was before everybody was getting their groceries delivered on Instacart. Like it was just, it was, it was not a normal thing to do. But yeah. it was them recognizing that it's going to take me two hours to like get in the car, go to the store, push my cart around the store, put the stuff in, come home, unload it, all that stuff. And two hours is a fair chunk of time. Like I could call a new client in that amount right. of time, right? I could write a proposal in that amount of time. <laughs> and, and those things are all worth the small cost of outsourcing the grocery delivery. Um, and, and so when you start to think about your time more strategically that way, um, it, it can help with it. And, and again, I, I'm not saying you have to do everything. Some things aren't worth it. And you mentioned unloading the, you know, the dishes. That's actually one of the hardest things to outsource because it has to be done every day and it only takes a little bit of time. Like there, nobody yeah. wants to come to your house for like 15 minutes every day, right? <laughs> like that's, that's almost impossible. I don't get that. Yeah, I, yeah I, you know, it's, it's actually not a job anyone wants. <laughs> um, so it's... Yep. Uh, that that's one of the harder things, and so you're not necessarily going to manage to get all of the stuff like that but yeah. maybe you could like reduce the load somehow i mean if you have somebody you know come to your house for a few hours two or three times a week to do things like meal prep and tidying up then so that's that time is available yeah yes yeah, so that's actually what we're doing now is that we're actually getting a nanny slash housekeeper mm -hmm. uh, starting in early january and 
for the time that our toddler's at daycare, she'll be at home, you know, managing those things when he comes home, spending time with him. So just going all in on it. And uh, I've always been, I'm a very nervous person, especially when it comes to spending money, just my, my nature in general, but I'm getting over that. And um, my goal next year is to push off as much as possible. And I think you can also, you know, reevaluate it too, right? Like you can tell yourself this, this isn't necessarily an expense for the rest of my life. Like, why don't we try it for a year? You know, and we can evaluate, like, did the business grow enough that we can see a trajectory to that have been a, a wise choice? And and my guess is it will be. Um, yeah. But that that's, you know, as a business person, you can analyze it that way. Um, yes. and, and rather than viewing this as like, you know, it's gone forever and I will never know. I mean, you invest in a lot of things that you don't know whether it will have a good yeah, return or not. Yeah, right now you're sounding just like my wife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what she told me last night. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's actually what we're doing. We're trying out for a year. All right, so, sounds good. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Yeah. All right, and that completes the tour of this beautiful uh, <laughs> office room. in Aventura, Florida. Uh, yeah, I, I'm so grateful to you, Laura, for doing this. I consider it a great act of generosity and friendship. And and um, I hope you guys all found it uh, helpful and, and, and enjoyable. So, all right, we're, we're in mid-December and we're gonna um, uh, look to the new year. And I'm curious, uh, what reflection, what New Year's resolution, what goal, uh, what are you thinking about as you enter, you know, wrap up this year and enter the new one? Um, well, as I'm thinking about goals for the next year, I mean, I just, I really do view it as, you know, picturing myself at this time next year. So end of 2023, what am I going to want to say that I have done, <laughs> right? Like what professional goals will I want to have accomplished? What personal goals will I want to have accomplished? And, you know, the list needs to be relatively short. Lots of things will happen in a year. Some things I have no idea, right? Like, I, I don't know what will happen in the next year. But some things I do want to say I have done and make that list because then over the next year, if you have that as the things you want to have accomplished by the end of 2023, you can start setting your schedule to make progress toward those things. Um, but if you haven't really thought about like what you'd like to be proud of at the end of the next year, um, I'm sure you'll be proud of something and those things will probably be great too. But if you have specific things that would like to have as an outcome, it helps to visualize them and then get them on the schedule. Okay, so what's your one of your goals for 2023? What do you want to be able to say in a year from now when we well, do this again? So I'm doing. I've been talking a lot about my reading projects. Um, in 2021, I read through War and Peace one chapter a day. There are 361 chapters. So January 1st to December 27th, I read one chapter a day. Got through the book. It was great. Um, I, this past year, I've read all the works of Shakespeare, reading three pages a day every day get through the year. I'm almost done. Um, so next year, I'm doing all the works of Jane Austen. So oh, by right. this time next year, I will have read all except like 30 pages <laughs> of, of Jane Austen. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the, that's the idea. Remind us not to be in your book club. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really not, not that hard. Happy. It's not that hard at all. It doesn't take that like this is like 15 minutes a day. Right. You know, I, I'm going to recommend we all do the Laura Vanderkam reading challenge and we read every single one of your books, <laughs> three pages a day. If you did three pages a day, we like, would get through them all. It's not, yeah, you'd easily get, it's not worse, <laughs> you know, she's not Shakespeare yet. She's getting there. She, she's not, the not Shakespeare quite, of time. Yeah. Uh, Laura, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Have a great uh, holidays and happy new year. All right. You guys too. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You. Bye.